Welcome to the Short Term Show, the show about short term rentals and long term wealth, with real property owners hosting real properties who are crushing it in the vacation and short term rental space. And here's your host, Avery Carl. This episode of the Short Term Show is brought to you by the Short Term Shop. 30-year fixed mortgages, tax benefits, and long-distance management training made easy are just a few of the perks of owning a short-term rental. The Short-Term Shop can help you buy and learn how to manage your property from anywhere in the world. Just go to theshorttermshop.com and click Get Connected. Again, that's theshorttermshop.com, and we are brokered by EXP. See y'all over there. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Short Term Show. Today we have Omid, the Rad Investor, and he's going to tell us a little bit about his journey in short term rental investing. How's it going, Omid? What's up, Avery? I mean, I'm super excited to be on the show. Um, you know, it's it's kind of crazy how this has gone full cycle. You know, I'm I'm a Avery Carl product. So, you know, I'm just excited to kind of, you know, show how you've been able to kind of have that butterfly effect across the investment community with short-term rentals. Oh, well, that's very sweet of you to say. <laughs> well, let's start off. Let's start at the beginning. Tell us how you got into real estate investing and what were you, what were you doing before that? What made you decide to, to get into this world? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so I'm from Southern California. I'm a father of three rambunctious children. Um, <clears throat> I did the very traditional thing that you, that a lot of people do, which is, you know, go to college, you know, get good grades, get a corporate job, um, try to move up the ladder. And uh, I had done this corporate job for about 18 years. I dabbled in a lot of real estate over the years, uh, but nothing really serious. And then the pandemic happened. And uh, during that time, uh, I was able to spend a lot more time with my family. So some people might think that's a curse. Some people thought it was a blessing. Um, you know, I think for me, it was uh, an opportunity to kind of revisit my priorities. And uh, luckily, I, I came across a, another a real estate investor who listened to your podcast. And like I said, that podcast is like the butterfly effect um, that, that you're on, on on Bigger Pockets. And um, they were like, "Hey, let, let's go to the Smoky Mountains. I'm investing." And and you know, his name is Alex Sabio. He's he's been he's been on. And um, and uh, I'm like, "Yeah, let's." Uh, you know, we're attempting to be apartment syndicators at the time. And and uh, we were not experienced enough. We all had corporate jobs or we, we all had different jobs that were a little bit more um, demanding and we didn't have the experience at the time. But I think that really led us to pivot into short-term rentals. And uh, I bought a five bedroom uh, cabin in the Smokies. The first, you know, I was I was very fortunate. It was the summer of, of COVID 2020. First offer, accepted, negotiated, you know, some credits. And, uh, you know, got started and, and, uh, you know, three years later, it's five cabins in, I think there's one under one or two under construction that are still waiting on and, and, uh, 21, uh, listings in Joshua tree. Okay. So five total cabins that you own waiting on two more. So that'll be seven cabins in the Smokies total and 21 in Joshua tree. That's a lot of properties. Yeah. So it's, uh, you know, I, um, I, I was able to do it through uh, leveraging partnerships. So um, that was a, a big piece of of how we were able to scale. So, uh, you know, I have two other partners. Uh, I think they've been on the show before as well. And, um, um, but, uh, you know, what we did was we all had uh, different strengths uh, and we were able to kind of, you know, stay in our lane as far as what we did. And of course, as you're growing, you wear all sorts of hats anyway. So it's almost like an internship. You know, you're the accountant, you're the operations, you're the communications, you're the, uh, you know, dealing with the, the contractor. So you, you do deal with a little bit of everything um, as you kind of go along the journey. Um, but I think like any other um, real estate transaction, there's three things you need. So, you know, one is money, uh, two is time, and three is experience. So uh, we started with the money, we run out of money. And then, but then we started building experience over time. And then we had somebody who had time. So, you know, my partner, Sarah, she had time. So we first started off with just, you know, Tony and I, we had corporate jobs and, and Sarah was the one that had time. We're like, hey, how about she run the short-term rental? And it was, it was just going to be a side hustle at the time. We realized how much money we were making at the time. And, and then we transitioned 
we're like, hey, how about we do another one? And we slowly started scaling. And I think we got up to like five properties. And at that point, we we're like, okay, we have no more money. What do we do? We have something going and we really enjoy it. So we started bringing in uh, capital partners to kind of help us purchase some of these homes and we were operating them and we had different equity splits that we agreed upon. And um, um, we, yeah, fast forward a couple of years and, and uh, you know, this kind of, you know, where we are now today. Okay. So I have a lot of questions here because that's a lot of properties in just a few years, even, you know, partners or not. So yeah. let's talk about how you finance the first few before you had to bring in partners. So what, what does the financing look like there? Yeah. So, uh, back then, so we, you know, we went to the short-term shop and, uh, you know, we leveraged a 10% down loan. So that was, um, you know, my wife also works a, a W2 job where she, she makes money. So we were doing loans. There was one, I have a couple of my name, a couple of my wife's name. We kind of spread them out. So we, and went to different markets. So, um, you know, we were, Joshua Tree was a market that was untapped at the, at the time when we first jumped into it. Uh, now it's, there's quite a few investors in there, but, uh, during the time we, um, identified, uh, that it was a, it was a growing market through, um, population growth, um, and uh, visitation growth. And, uh, the charts kept seeing growth over time and not an, not a lot of inventory. Um, but yeah, to answer your question, we started off with, uh, 10% down loans. Um, and then we we shifted to investment loans as uh, loan products kind of changed a little bit where they started applying points and um, and even DSCR loan products. So it's been a kind of a combination of, of those uh, as far as uh, uh, loan products that, that we've uh, leveraged. Okay. And then when you have, when you bring the partners in, what kind of financing are you looking at there? And then let's talk about partner partnership structure. Yeah. Yeah. So as far as uh, partners themselves, so it, I guess it depends on like whether we had the relationship with the partner at the time or not um, and whether what loan products were available. So initially it was 10% downloads with people that we had relationships with. And eventually we had to transition into kind of like a 15% investment loan sort of um, product, uh, especially as the rates shifted and um they applied there were so many points applied that it almost made more sense to just do the 15 percent uh investment loan product okay so at what point did we switch to the 15 percent investment loan like pre-covid or post-covid oh post yeah so yeah yeah definitely definitely post-covid i'm gonna say it was like uh it's been about a year now so i would say it was probably what once they we've seen the shift in in the rates which was probably March of last year, I'm going to say. Um, so it was, it was sometime around that time. And equity splits kind of changed over time. They evolved. So we've we've done all sorts from 50-50 deals where somebody brings in 50% of the capital or they bring the, the full capital and we split 50 equity. Um, we've also done deals where we brought some cash, but we charge a property management fee. So it's kind of evolved. It's anywhere from equity from 30 to 50%. Um, in those deals, depending on, you know, again, the rates, because we also want to, when we're doing underwriting, we want to make sure that we had certain returns for investors. So the targeted return for investors, it varied anywhere from pre the the change in rates, it was 20% and it's kind of evolved to 15%. Um, but now we're not, we're not doing those partnerships anymore, just because kind of where we are at this stage, it's, it just doesn't make sense for, there's just not enough to, to kind of go around for, you know, based on the rates and, and, and the prices. Okay. So let's talk a little about where you find partners. Cause I know a lot of people have this question. They're like, Oh, I'm out of cash or I don't have any cash to start with, but I really want to get in the game. How do I do this? Let's try to find some partners. So where do you find a, a partner and, and what are the questions that you ask? Yeah, for sure. So as far as partners, um, I think, for somebody that's just getting started, I, I would definitely say, I mean, this is going to be a very cliche answer, but, uh, you know, go to go go to your local meetup, um, start there. So I know when we started, it, everything was virtual. So it was really virtual, virtual meetups. So it was Zoom meetups. It was Facebook groups. Uh, you know, you, you eventually you you can tell who's maybe interested in partnering, but I think it just be active, contribute to a community. And um, you're going to have people reaching out to you um, and asking questions. 
And I think as they start asking questions, you kind of see if your goals align. Uh, so one of the th things that we were looking for was, uh, you know, a minimum of a, a five-year hold. So we want a minimum of a five-year hold when it came to um, uh, holding the short-term rentals, but we preferred actually like a longer term hold. So five was a minimum, but we were looking more 10 plus if that was, if that was a possibility, but an availability of an exit of, of five years. Um, also just like financial situation, just seeing, ensuring that there's a, a level of liquidity um, just for any sort of scenario. Um, also, if it's like a, a first time investor, just ensuring that they're understanding, because I think as understanding what they're investing in and what the expectations were. So, it was kind of a combination of those things. Uh, but yeah, local meetups now in this sort of environment, I would say local meetups, you're going to meet people. There's going to be a combination of those who are experienced, but those who are looking to learn. Okay. And so what kind of questions do you have to answer when these people are coming to you and asking questions about potentially partnering? What are some of the things that they say, I'm a new investor and I'm thinking of finding a partner. What are some, some questions yeah. I should be prepared to answer? Yeah. So I think the, the biggest thing is a proof of concept. So people want to know what your track record is and what your experience level is. So it's really having um, some financials to back it up. So, uh, you know, for myself, I would do demonstrations where I would show certain properties, um, kind of compare. So even showing comparison between your properties and, and other properties within the market uh, and even like how it perform, how they perform relative to the market. And uh, I think when you start, I think people will just want to see visually numbers and that it makes sense and and your forecast. So if the forecasts match kind of the performance, um, I think there's a lot more confidence in, in the relationship as far as being able to deliver. And so I, I would say, you know, have that proof of concept so that you can share your expertise, because I think as as you share your expertise, um, that can, you know, answer a lot of questions somebody might have. Okay. And so you're in two markets. So you're in the Smoky Mountains in Tennessee and you're in Joshua Tree. How did you choose those two markets? Yeah. So Smokies, it was just literally, it's the best, best market. Everybody's going into it. And this was uh, mid uh, 2000s. And, and we, it was the same thing for me. I like the cliff notes version of finding somebody that's doing something well and replicating it. So at the time it was Alex, he was one month in, he's like, I'm killing it. I'm making all this money. So we jumped into the Smoky Mountain. So that was, that was really like how we jumped into the Smokies. Um, part of it was the right timing, like being in the right time, right place. Our underwriting wasn't really sophisticated at that, that point. We were not really familiar with like underwriting and, and gross revenues. And it was just like, Hey, I'm, this is my mortgage and I'm making some money. And and that's kind of how we jumped into it. As we so slowly started understanding underwriting more and returns, then we started looking at, at markets. But Joshua Tree essentially was a, a market where it was local, it was in our backyard. Um, it was the least regulated of anything in California at the time. And um, when we looked at growth within um, visitation, um, there was significant growth from like 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and it, there was a upward trajectory. So for me, I, I was not a fan of Joshua Tree. I'm not a desert guy. I like the beach. I like the mountains. I, I don't like the desert. Um, I'm slowly learning to love it, but uh, we just kind of stuck to the data and just jumped into Joshua Tree. And uh, our very first property, we bought it as a turnkey. So again, we we're still new. So we were still trying to kind of figure it out. It was a turnkey Airbnb that was already performing. We purchased it. I think it was 300,000 at the time. It was a two bed, two bath. Um, I think it was grossing maybe, I, I think the previous owner, and it wasn't grossing that much. Now that we, now that I think about it, it was like 30, 36,000 or something like that. But uh, we made some minor updates and and the trajectory of that was, it was gonna gross in the sixties after we had made the, the modifications. Um, and then we 1030 won that actually into a in one of the um, property, one of the cabins in the Smokies. And at the time, I think we sold it like a year and a half later for, I'm going to say it was uh, 487 or something like that. 
Hey guys, hope you are enjoying this week's episode of the short term show. We are loving it. We are loving interviewing all these guests for you guys, and we hope you're getting a lot of value out of it. And we just, we really love you guys. We love you so much that we have created a community just for you. We have a Facebook group specifically for short term rental investors, and there are tons of great posts every day, sharing best practices, learning new things from other short-term rental investors. And we would love to see you over there. The name of the group is the same name as my book, Short-Term Rental, Long-Term Wealth. Head over and join the conversation. We look forward to seeing you over there. Thanks, guys. Hopefully you guys are finding all of these short-term show episodes to be really helpful. We certainly hope that you are, but maybe you have more questions and you just want to be able to ask an expert a certain question here and there. Well, we have at the short-term shop open office hours on Zoom every Thursday and you can sign up for free. So if you head over to strquestions.com, you can sign up to hop on and we will answer any questions that you have on short-term rental investing. Again, it's every Thursday and you can sign up at strquestions.com. Do you have a favorite between the Smokies or you said you're not a, a desert guy, but in terms of performance, Smokies or Joshua Tree? Yeah. So I, I, so after that first experience with, with Joshua Tree, we, the second one that we purchased was a tiny home. So it was a new construction build, tiny home. So the, the intent, it was a 400 square foot, kind of like a studio, but it had everything that you needed. So essentially you kind of combine the, the glamping concept with a actual new build, um, hot tub, uh, you have some basic amenities and from a cost uh, perspective that again, the, the price point was 30. It was, uh, the first one we ever purchased was 285. And, um, and then they evolved over between 285 to 350. But this one studio, uh, we initially, I think we were grossing, I'm going to say, um, in the forties. And after we continued to learn the market and make modifications, I think our best performing one was grossing like 90 in the nineties. And so why I like it, because to answer your question, why do I like it? It's very efficient. It's easy to clean. There's, it's very hard for anything to go wrong. It's new construction. People love it. From a um, conversion standpoint, you, we, can get, we get a lot of last minute bookings. So amongst all the listings that are out there, if it's low, that's the one that's going to get booked. So it just consistently performs really well. So I think a lot of people jumped into Joshua Tree. And um, currently in the market, a lot of people who have just a regular homes, they may be struggling um, or they're barely breaking even. But I think these new construction tiny homes, they do really well and um, and they're very cost effective. So that's kind of my favorite product because it's the least headache, most bang for your buck, least amount of effort. Yeah, we do have a studio that I love. It's just it's very low maintenance. And um, I totally agree with that. Tiny homes, especially. A lot of the smaller properties, and I can't speak for Joshua Tree because I don't own anything there, but I found smaller properties typically have a higher occupancy rate. They may not make as much yeah. money overall, but yeah. if you're a new investor who's really worried about any kind of seasonality, I think a smaller property is the way to go because it just, when you're new, it just feels better to have a fuller calendar. And um, I, I'm a big fan of small properties. I've got all sizes nowadays, but uh, yeah. I have a special place in my heart for the smaller ones because they do make you feel confident and good and like, okay, yes, I can do this before you jump into a big one and you're like, oh my gosh, in the off season at, at the beach or whatever. So uh, big fan of, of little properties. Oh yeah, absolutely. All right, cool. So let's move on a little bit. So you guys have owned at least in one market, maybe both, since before COVID. And so you've got a track record. You know what your property should be making year over year. So what do you make of, and what has been your experience with this whole um, Airbnb bust? And then that thing, that chart that came out the other day saying everything's dropped by like 50%. I can't remember the exact uh, the exact metrics that used because I don't have it in front of me, but like the entire internet flipped out about this. I know you know the one I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> so what have you guys seen in, in both markets? Yeah, I mean, it, there's definitely been a drop. I mean, there's there's a drop, uh, but I, I just think it's very property specific, very um, 
operator specific. So I know there's like some some general uh, trends, but um, yeah, like for us, I would say we're probably down twenty percent uh, overall in the portfolio, which is I think it's pretty consistent with with like you know most markets. Um, but I but I think it's can't. I think what's happened is a lot of people, especially like let's say Joshua Tree, a lot of people are getting scared and they are dropping their prices. But what that does is then it causes other people to drop their prices. So I think it, instead of focusing on pricing, it's just focusing on, okay, where can we improve, whether it's like the customer experience or something different uh, for the property. So that's kind of what we're trying to reassess for all our properties right now. We're trying to figure out, um, cause people are willing to pay a premium for the experience. So what can we do different in each listing um, to, to kind of revisit the property? And I think that's the, the process that we're kind of going through right now. But to, to answer your question, a lot of people are flipping out. I, I know that's, uh, I think a lot of people who are not in the industry, I think that it's like an easy way to jump in and, and, and poke fun at, of, of Airbnbs. But I think if you if you know what you're doing and you're pivoting and you're making adjustments, that's part of the process of being an operator. Like what worked six months ago, it doesn't work today. What worked a year ago doesn't work today. So it just, I think we're constantly evolving. And and as part of being a student in this game is also just, is just really just talking it out and, and figuring out what we can do to kind of make the industry better. One for guests, but also as operators. Yeah, that's, that's what really with any business. So what worked yesterday or six months ago or last year or 10 years ago isn't always going to be what works now. So I did the math on on our properties. We're about 3%, 3.25% down over last year. So we're pretty flat compared to a lot of the, the quote unquote air quotes stats out there. So I think that it's really now it's more about being a good operator and making sure that you're buying the right property. So I found uh, John Bianchi yesterday told me on a, on a different recording, he's the Airbnb data guy, said that right now, you know, a lot of what differentiates who's doing well and who isn't is the level of amenity. So if you already own a property and you're like, oh man, I'm down a little last year, what can I do? Adding a super cool amenity, whatever that may be, uh, it can be really expensive or not expensive. It can be as inexpensive as we've got one of our agents is adding like a snow cone machine to her to her short term rental in Panama City. So just things like that can really make a difference. And things that you can show are different. Like I know I would rent a place with a snow cone machine. My kids would love that. They would die. So and that's not an expensive ad. So I think that just really focusing on your amenities and also making sure that you're focusing on your pricing, because a lot of times I've heard a lot of investors this year say, oh, yeah, I quit paying good attention. And then all of a sudden my calendar is empty and it's too uh, too late to really do anything. So I think that uh, there's definitely ways to improve now. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. So like kind of to just echo what you said. So for example, we, we had a property that was underperforming and it was a home in, in Joshua tree. And what we ended up doing is we, we converted the garage into a game room and, and we made it kind of like an Orlando style Mario type of room. And, and um, it's interesting how there's not a lot of listings in Joshua tree specifically that have uh, game rooms that are well done. And because of that, I mean, that property now, the, the occupancy since we did that, which was last November, has been probably like 85%. And, and I would say the revenue probably jumped maybe 50 to 70%, depending on the month. So, and that was a, a $13,000 investment in, in the actual um, garage. So I think little things like that, it just, I think sometimes people are afraid to put money into building an amenity or or trying something creative or something different, but uh, it definitely pays dividends because most people are not willing to do that. So if you're the one person, um, you know, take something from another a market that that is successful and bring it to your market. And I think that's that's just another way, as you know, as you continue to be a student of of just different markets. Yeah, I totally totally agree with that. If you look at big markets like Kissimmee or. Scottsdale, where everything is like really, really, really well done and apply that to a market where there's not a lot of stuff that's really well done. It's I I think people just don't realize it. It doesn't take a whole lot of effort. Um, and 
being that we just got off of our our big summer trip and we stayed in several Airbnbs, I'm used to being in this bubble of people who do things really well and obsess over every little thing. People are constantly asking really detailed questions in our community about what do I do about this? How do I do this? So I falsely thought that the entire short-term rental uh, investing world was doing that and, and managing really well. And we stayed in several over the course of the last few months that we were like, man, this is not, this is the real world is not the short-term shop community. So, <laughs> the short-term so shop true. community so is like, true. yeah, everybody is on it in there. But I mean, we had problems with like people, the listing didn't disclose that they live there and just leave when <laughs> you rent <laughs> and their food was in there. And oh, I'm like, wow. great. Like, I don't know, like my kids, my, my son is two, you know, and we keep yeah, a really close eye sure. on them, but it's like, I would like to be able to just chill and not have to worry yes. about what's in the drawer or what's, you know, if he opens the pantry and what's in there. So um, it's just not everyone is paying as much attention as, as the community that we see. So uh, you guys definitely are. So I think that, that you're going to continue to improve. So that's awesome. Yeah, no, that's, it's, it's so true. Like when you travel, you have a certain level of expectation and it's, it's hard because you set that standard for yourself and then you go to other Airbnbs thinking, oh, yeah, well, everybody does that, right? Because that's that's my norm. And then you realize, oh, wait, that is not the norm from I, I remember going to an Airbnb where I couldn't figure out all the lights like we label all, we label all the all the switches. and I couldn't figure it out. And it was just the most annoying thing, like going around, p- pushing all the buttons, um, even the coffee, like something simple as like a coffee bar, like, you know, they, they you know, they label it a coffee bar, but just the the quality of the of the coffee bar or not even having coffee like it's a coffee bar but there's no coffee you bring your own coffee um it's just the littlest things like that and and even like you know how you supply your you know shampoo and conditioner and and like you know a certain presentation of it and, and they have the big bottles like just set up like it's it's like their home and and uh but but you're absolutely right it's there's there's a lot of room for improvement and, and just across the industry and and uh, but set the standard high and study those that do do it well and and adopt some things that you can either you know make your own twist to it and um you know for me uh, specifically I'm I'm working on a, a like a solo project where I bought a tiny home it's a, a new construction but it's a two bed tiny home and this is what I've learned in in that Josh Tree market is the top grossing properties they all have um a in-ground pool that's that's a new style like you know kind of like a lounging style pool so what i've done is i i purchased this home uh, i'm gonna i'm in the process of getting the permit to build the pool and then you you see the you know the properties like in scottsdale and, and you know they all have the little mini putting green so i'm gonna do that as well so i'm gonna add the mini putting in when i look at that uh the market there's not really is very few that actually have it in joshua tree so just combining some of those things and, and just going to see what happens. But I, I think it's the the days of, hey, I have a hot tub. Hey, I have a swing. You know, I have a fire pit. That's not enough. So you got to do something different. And, uh, you know, that's that's something that I'll work on. And, you know, I'll be sharing as the, the process as, as I go along. Cool. Well, we'll be sure to follow along. So, uh, Omid, we are to the end of the show where we ask our final three questions that we ask everyone that comes on the show. Sure. Same questions for everyone. So first question, what advice would you give 20-year-old Omid? 20-year-old Omid. Um, I would say don't don't chase the money. So chase the skill. So I think there's um, a lot of people... Whether whether you go and you know you graduate, whether you decide to go to college or you decide to pursue a trade, I think the first thing people think about is is money. But I think it's mastering a skill, and if you are the best at that skill, money will come. So for for myself, I enjoyed um, going out, having fun in twenties like everybody else. And but but I think one thing that I always did was I always try to work hard at whatever I it was and. I think that translates into whatever you do. So do that, find a mentor, and uh, you'll be set up for success. Really great advice. Next question, what advice do you have for a new investor who's getting started today? High interest rate, climate, what are we telling them? Man, okay. 
I think understand your, your one, reset your expectations. I think every environment is different, but reset your expectations. I think there's, when you hear, uh, like, let's say David Green, um, he's talking about, I listened to an interview he did with, uh, or him and Brandon Turner, and he he talks about how there's this cash flow is, is being thrown around a lot the past couple of years, and, and everybody's expectation is cash flow. But what's happening now is there's no cash flow. Or it's very difficult to source a property that's going to hit certain cash flow uh, criteria within your buy box. So just just get just get your you know feet in the you know uh, wet and 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 get started. And I think that will allow you to kind of pivot and understand as you start doing something. So don't let the cash flow prevent you from from getting started. Um, and then just understand your threshold for discomfort because some people want to get into real estate, but they don't want to put in the work. So really understand your commitment level. I, I've had so many investors come up to me and say, oh, I want to get into real estate, but they, they don't really do anything. Um, they rather go on the weekends, have fun. Uh, they want to wake up late. Um, so I think just understand your habits and your threshold for your commitment to your goal. Um, but if you're not, if you know you're a person that's really doesn't stick to anything, uh, maybe real estate is, is not for you. Also really great advice. And last question, what's your favorite book that has impacted your mindset? Yeah. So there's, there's a book called turn, wait, there's a book called rich dad, poor dad. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to use that answer because everybody uses the answer. Um, there's a book called turning pro by Stephen Pressfield. So it's, it's really a habit book. So it really talks about the moment you turn pro and life becomes easier because you have a certain level of habits um, that allow you to put you in a position to to achieve your goal. So um, I would say like, you know, the difference between an amateur and a pro is their habits. You got amateur habits and you got pro habits. I, I know you, for example, Avery, you wake up at 4 a.m., right? You, you wake up early. So that's, there's a reason why you are where you are because you have, um, a, you know, a certain um, uh, set of habits that you carry across everything that you do. And I think the same for myself. Like I wake up every day at 4 a.m. just like you. And it's, you know, I have the three kids. I have a four, six, and eight-year-old. If I wake up around when they, I can get anything done. So it's, I, I got to wake up early. I got my me time. I got my gym time. Um, but it's really being able to time block and set up those habits for success. Awesome. Great recommendation. I don't think anyone has recommended that yet. Well, thank you again so much for coming on, Omid. And if our listeners want to check you out, follow you, do all that fun stuff, where can they do that? Sure. So uh, you can find me on IG, Omid, the Rad Investor. So Omid, O-M-I-D, and then the Rad Investor. You can find me, uh, our, my podcast, so Find Your Freedom Podcast. So uh, you, you can go on the website uh, as well, findyourfreedomrei.com. Um, I also have a co-host company, so Nomadic co-host. So it's nomadic and then cohost.com. So if you need some co-host services, um, yeah, come, come, come look me up and, and, you know, we can connect. All right. Well, thank you again so much. I mean, we'll catch you next time. Thank you so much.